Okay, so today we've got a classic, Don Quixote by Cervantes. Some of you may have noticed, if you've been following this channel closely for a while, that I've been making references to this book for a long time now. As in, this, I've been slowly chipping away at this book for ages. And I'm finally finished with it, and here's the review. And there is so much to talk about. Um, I, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of this or not, but uh, Don Quixote by Cervantes is somewhat the equivalent to Spanish literature, what Shakespeare's plays are to English literature, meaning the commentary on Don Quixote is just overwhelming. Every chapter has been poured over. There are supposedly multiple meanings to each chapter. You know, there's, uh, there's the story, but then there's a the symbolism, and then there's a satire, and everything's either a satire on the Catholic Church, or the Spanish government, or the merchant class, or, you know, the whole thing is supposedly just rich with meaning, and the commentary is just overwhelming. So that, that means a couple of things. One is, uh, well, one, the, the most basic thing is, I, I will not be giving the definitive commentary on Don Quixote. I'm just going to talk about some of the basics, and I'm going to talk about my impressions, and my impressions as a Philistine, meaning, you know, just kind of an average guy in the 21st century, judging this on readability and how enjoyable it was to get through, etc. Um... But yeah, it, it also means that I am not going to even attempt to get through everything here. And I, quite fr frankly, I don't need to because if, if you want to dive deeper into Don Quixote, that stuff is out there. Uh, in fact, while, while I was reading this book, I was searching on YouTube and there are whole channels on YouTube devoted to talking about Don Quixote. I'll, I'll try and remember to link to one of the ones in the description down below, but it's a whole channel that goes through chapter by chapter and talks about the different symbolism in each chapter and the meanings and stuff like that. Not, not, not to mention all the print sources you could consult. Uh, the other thing is, uh, this camera I'm using has a 30 minute time limit after which it, which is going to automatically shut off. Uh, apologies in advance for the inevitable awkward ending at the end of this video where the camera is going to cut me off in mid-sentence. But on the whole, I usually view that 30-minute time limit as a blessing in disguise. Because at, at 30 minutes, really, it's time to wrap up the video. I mean, nobody wants to hear me ramble on for three hours about Don Quixote, even though there's tons of stuff to talk about in here. So... That's, that's the clock I'm going to be racing against to try and talk about as much as I can talk about and, until we get to the end of 30 minutes and then I'm going to have to either wrap it up or get cut off abruptly by the camera. Uh, the other thing as well, if, if you've been watching this channel, I tend to mix in my reviews with my own personal take on the book, talking about how I found the book, what my reading experience was like. It, it's, it's going to be a personal journey through Don Quixote as much as it may be an informative journey through Don Quixote, but I'm also going to try to make this informative because my impression is that outside of literature students, you know, people who took some English courses in college, most people don't know anything about Don Quixote. That was certainly the case for me about 15 years ago, be before I started kind of hearing bits and pieces about it, which made me gradually more and more curious to check it out. Of course, this is booktube, so the average viewer probably maybe does know a little bit about more about Don Quixote. On the other hand, this is YouTube, so I, I don't know, I'm, I'm just going to start maybe with the bare basics. So the bare basics you already know. I'm, I'm going to assume that everybody is more or less familiar with the basic premise of this story just through cultural osmosis. The basic premise of the story is uh, that Don Quixote is a gentleman who has read too many stories about heroic knights. Uh, I, I believe the term for this is chivalric romances. Uh, the, the romances about knights and heroes uh, and stuff like that. 
He read too many of them, uh, and he, he lost his grip on reality. And now he thinks that he's a knight going about in the heroic age, fighting, uh, fighting other knights and rescuing princes and fighting giants. And his delusion is such that he is always misinterpreting the things around him. The most famous example I suspect everybody knows. He sees a windmill. He, he thinks it's a giant. So he charges on his uh, horse with his lance drawn to fight the giant. And of course it turns out to just be a windmill and then he gets knocked aside by the windmill. Or the there's, there's a herd of sheep and he thinks it's an army and he goes down to fight the sheep. Or he goes to a castle, sorry, he goes to a, an inn, a humble inn, and he thinks it's a castle. And there are some prostitutes there in the courtyard and he thinks they are princesses. And he, he just has totally lost his grip on reality. Uh, and he, he thinks everything is something out of a medieval romance. Now that much I suspect you already knew, just by cultural osmosis or cartoons or comic books, that, that's pretty common knowledge. What, what always used to puzzle me as a kid, uh, seeing references to Don Quixote and comic books and stuff like that, is how you could possibly get a whole book out of that. Uh, and not only a whole book, but this is a very thick book. There, there's a lot of text to get through in this book. And in fact, this edition here I have is how many pages is this? This is uh, 768 pages before you get to the end notes. But as you know, the page numbers themselves are not the whole story. Uh, for, for one thing, the pages are a bit big. I mean, you can compare this maybe with a smaller size paperback and you can see the, the pages extend a bit. But also, uh, let me see if I can get this to show up on the camera. Maybe, sorry, the focus on this camera is not great, but perhaps you can see uh, the, the margins are small, the print is small, and there's not a lot of paragraph breaks. It, it's one of those books that's uh, either printed cheaply or trying to save paper, and so they don't make paragraph breaks when a, when a new character talks, uh, even though there's in some passages, a lot of talking between characters is all part of the same paragraph. Whereas compare this to a book like this, uh, where there's a lot more paragraph breaks, uh, shorter pages, larger print size, bigger margin. The, the point I'm trying to make is, as you already know, uh, page page numbers do not say everything. This is this book is even longer and bigger than these page numbers would indicate. So, so how do you possibly get uh, a book this long out of a premise that flimsy, which, which is, you know, a, a guy thinks he's fighting giants when he's really fighting windmills. So, so that, uh, hopefully I'll answer that question by the end of this review. That was a question I always had in my mind uh, when I first heard about this book. Um, I also encountered in, in my life a few people, not many but a few, who really love this book. I, I used to have a, f a British friend several years ago who had finished Don Quixote and talked about how it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever read and he was trying to find another book that he thought was as great. And, and th there are a few people like that. Uh, some of them on booktube. Maybe you've seen some of those videos. Um, my own impression of this book, I'm not going to praise it nearly that highly. I found sections of it to be a slog, to be honest. But uh, it, I didn't hate it completely either, though. I'll, I'll get to my review later. But, but there, there are definitely a lot of fans of this book. What really got me interested in this book, though, was, uh, the, great, uh, was it the Great Courses Lecture Series. History of World Literature by Professor John Vogt, who had a whole lecture devoted to this book in which he talks about all the different narrative techniques or subversions of narrative that are going on in this book. And he made it sound really interesting. And, and I'll talk through some of the things he highlighted, which are in the book and which, which made me think that this, is, this would be really interesting. 
Uh, Cervantes throughout this book is playing with the idea of the narrator. So he's, he starts off telling the story about Don Quixote uh, and then in the story uh, he says uh, th there's a point when Don Quixote is getting in a fight with somebody uh, and, and Don Quixote is raising his sword and he's about to strike down and then all of a sudden the chapter comes to an end and Cervantes says, well, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but the history that I was copying out of seems to have come to an end here. So I don't know what happens next. And then the next chapter is Cervantes talking about how he was at a market and he noticed that the paper that uh, some of the fish was wrapped in, uh, fish or meat, I don't remember, was actually more of the history of Don Quixote. So he was negotiating to buy this paper from the market boy. The market boy didn't realize what the value of it was. But then the story is all in Arabic and Cervantes is a Spanish speaker. And I, you know, I suspect this has something to do with the history of Spain at this point and you know, the reconquest from the, the Moors. Um, and he, uh, the, the, that's another thing I forgot to mention, and th is this book is very famous for its embodiment of Spanish history or Spanish culture at the time that it was written, uh, 1605, I think it was written. So uh, th then he's got to get a translator, and the translator translates it into English, and then for the, sorry, into Spanish, into Spanish. Uh, the book was originally written in Spanish. Uh, my translation is English. But then through the rest of the book, uh, he's referencing, he says, okay, well, this is what the Ar Arabic historian Sid Hamat has written about Don Quixote. And we all know that you can trust the Moors on these kind of things, or you all know that the Moors might exaggerate on this type of things, but it's also being filtered through a translator. So, for example, at the beginning of one of the chapters in part two, there's a translator's note where the translator said, Okay, well, this is the text I've been given, but I can't really believe it because Sancho Panza, Sancho Panza is Don Quixote's sidekick, is talking in a way that he doesn't usually talk in. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry, I've just found the part here. The translator of this history, being come to this fifth chapter, thinks fit to inform the reader that he holds it to be apocryphal. Excuse me. That he holds it to be apocryphal because it introduces Sancho speaking in another style than could be expected from his slender capacity and saying things of so refined a nature that it seems impossible he could do it. However, he thought himself obliged to render it into our tongue to maintain the character of a faithful translator. So you, you have the original historian, then you have the translator's comment on the original historian, and then you have the author, Cervantes, comment on all of it. Uh, and now, of course, in reality, it's, uh, in reality, it's all coming out of Cervantes' brain. There, there was no history of Don Quixote he unearthed, obviously. But the, the novel is structured with these different layers of narration on it. And uh, that struck me as really interesting. And I, I don't know what the word is for that. Postmodern or, you, you know, just meta? playing with the narrative, and it, it, it's a, a reminder that a lot of the stuff that we think is new and avant-garde is, is not new at all. Uh, Cervantes was playing around with the idea of the narrator and the idea of meta-humor way, way back in 1605, and so that, that got me interested to read Don Quixote. But the other thing that John Vogt talks about in his lectures is the sequel to Don Quixote. Now, again, I, I suspect this is um, something that you wouldn't know unless you took a college literature course, maybe. But uh, Don Quixote is actually two books. Uh, there's the original Don Quixote, which was published in, I don't remember, 1605 or something like that. And then there was a sequel that was published two years later. Sorry, ten years later. The sequel was published ten years later. So it's, it's, and I've, I've, I've got, I'm holding it exactly here where the division is in the book. So you can see maybe the, the part two is actually longer. I think part two in this edition is 401 pages and part one is 300 and, 
63 pages. Of, of course, as I just said earlier, page numbers don't always mean anything. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, it's actually two books in one. And part of me actually thinks maybe I should have reviewed this separately. Um, you know, review part one and then review part two. Uh, except at this point, it took me so long to finish this book that I, I, it's all fading a bit in the memory and I'm just going to try and review it as a whole. That plus, I think nowadays you would never find it sold as two separate books. Nowadays publishers always put it together in one book as Don Quixote, but it, it is two separate books. And the sequel takes place ten years later. And in the sequel, uh, Don Quixote and the rest of the characters have access to the original Don Quixote book, if, if that makes sense. So in, in the world of the sequel, the, the original Don Quixote has been published and all the other characters can read it. And so characters will, and, and um, in Cervantes' own day, Don Quixote was a massive success after it was published. It was like really popular back in his day. Everyone was reading it. So when he starts the sequel 10 years later, then all the characters are like, Hey, you're Don Quixote. I, I read all about you in that great book that everyone was reading. Uh, so like, like, it's like Don Quixote is a real person and everyone has read about him in the book. Um, and I thought, boy, that, that's a, another really interesting meta idea. Um, now, now what Cervantes does is even though the sequel was published 10 years later, it takes place only like a month later. So like in the internal narrative of the book, part two starts only one month later after part one ended. And I, in that time, somehow this whole history was written and circulated and read by everyone. And of course that's impossible. And that's, I think Cervantes just playing with the reality of the narration again and more meta humor. But it, anyways, uh, the characters can talk to Don Quixote and tell him about how they read about him in the first book. And Don Quixote and his character Sancho can comment about uh, how they thought they came out in the first book. Uh, Don Quixote actually never reads the first book himself, but he has other characters tell him about it. Uh, and th and there's, there's more playing around with the meta, meta narrative. Uh, like there are... Uh, stories within a story in part one and in part two some of the characters comment that they didn't like those stories within a story uh, which was apparently a, a criticism Cervantes got during his day. Characters in part two will comment on some of the continuity errors in part one. Uh, so j just a lot of fun like that going on. Uh, the other thing which makes part two interesting is in the intervening years between part one was published and part two was published, uh, somebody wrote an unauthorized sequel to Don Quixote. Uh, nobody knows who it was. It was published anonymously. Uh, but th there's, there's an unauthorized sequel that was published which Cervantes did not like. Now, John Vaught, Professor John Vaught, in his uh, History of World Literature that I was just mentioning earlier, if memory serves, he implies that that unauthorized sequel was the reason that Cervantes finally got off his butt and wrote his own sequel. That's kind of a response to the unauthorized sequel. I've read other people who said that Cervantes was already underway with Don Quixote sequel when the unauthorized sequel came out. And the evidence for that is that references to the unauthorized sequel don't start coming up until part two is, uh, until late in part two. So he had already written a whole bunch of part two and then the unauthorized sequel came out. But, but then they, they do start coming up. They, they do start coming out at a certain point in part two, all these references to the unauthorized sequel. So characters will say to Don Quixote, oh yeah, I, I read about you. You went to this town and you did this. And Don Quixote would say, what? I never went to that town. And then people will talk about to, talk to Don Quixote and Sancho about their exploits in the unauthorized sequel. And Don Quixote and Sancho will say, well, that's, that's obviously terrible. Whoever wrote that is an idiot. Uh, and, and Sancho, Don Quixote's sidekick, will say, well, how do I come out? And they say, well, you, you come out as just kind of a, a greedy glutton 
uh, with no, no other character at all, uh, which ap apparently is how he came out in the unauthorized sequel. And Sancho was said, well, surely this is written by somebody who doesn't know how to develop character then, if, if that's just the one note character I'm written out as. Uh, so, so more meta humor here. Not, not only are they interacting with their literary portrayal in the original Don Quixote, they're interacting with their literary portrayal in the unauthorized sequel. And yeah, and in addition to that, uh, whoever wrote this unauthorized sequel apparently took some jibes at Cervantes. Uh, apparently he mocked him for being old, he mocked him for uh, being a cripple, Cervantes had lost the use of his right hand. Was it the right or the left? The, the use of one of his hands in a big battle, which I should... Sorry, with apologies, I don't remember the battle, and I should because it's one of these big, very historically important battles, naval battle, which Cervantes was in. Um, and so then we start the preface of part two with Cervantes hitting back at his anonymous rival. He says, Bless me, reader, gentle or simple or whatever you may be. How impatiently by this time you must expect this preface, supposing it to be nothing but revengeful invectives against the author of the second Don Quixote. So, so the readers know that he's going to fire back. He said, but I must beg your pardon, for I shall say no more of him than everybody says. Uh, that Tordalicis is a place where he was begotten, and Tarango is a place where he was born. And though it be universally said that even when trod upon, that even a worm when trod upon will turn again, yet I am resolved for once to cross the proverb. You perhaps now would have me call him a coxcomb, fool, and madman, but I am of another mind, and so let his folly be its own punishment. Um, but then after saying all that, then he does get into it and, and kind of respond to, to some of the comments. Uh, but there is something which I cannot so silently pass over. He is pleased to upbraid me with my age. Indeed, had it been in the power of man to stop the career of time, I would not have suffered the old gentleman to have laid his fingers on me. Uh, the, and then he goes on to talk about the accusation of the hand, and he, he goes on for this for about uh, one, two, three, four, four and a half pages or so. So that that's good fun. You know, the, these two authors feuding across the centuries still fun, sorry, not feuding across the centuries, they were feuding in their own time. We are reading it from centuries distance, but it, it, it's still very fun and interesting to read. So, all of that uh, is the reasons why this book uh, appealed to me and why I wanted to read it. And, and <clears throat> having read it now, I can say that all of it is definitely in there and all of that is it, it is quite interesting for what it is. Um, where this book gets to be a slog, a bit of a slog, is, you know, like I said before, it's 768 pages of quite densely printed material. And there's a lot of other stuff in here to wade through, some of which is not quite as engaging. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Actually, you know what? You know what? I will make two videos out of this. I, I, I said I was only going to make one video, but I am going to make t two videos out of this. So why don't, why don't for once I actually stop the video before I get automatically cut off? Uh, it's not quite 30 minutes, but it's getting close to it. The timer here says 2421. Uh, and then I'll make another, recharge the battery, make another video in which I talk about my actual reading experience with this book.